Hello everybody, I hope that you can all hear me okay. Um, I'm sure Yassine will tell me if not. So I would like to say, first of all, thank you very much for coming along to this webinar. Um, and the title of it so far is, how do we really record lectures making the best use of multiple evidence sources in a large institutional evaluation project? So what I'm going to talk about uh, in this presentation is a little bit about what we know about lecture recording, thinking about what evidence means in this context. But then I'm really going to take a bit more of an operational viewpoint and think about what do we know about evidence, what is evidence in this context. And then I'm going to talk about the work that we did at Edinburgh. Um, as we've talked a lot about the Edinburgh experience. I'm really going to try and talk about the uh, the context that we had when we were doing our work and how I think it uh, is an example of how we were really led by um, the enhancement themes in a lot of ways. I'm then going to share some resources that we've produced to try and hopefully let you guys, if you're thinking about introducing lecture recording or you're in the process of introducing lecture recording, hopefully you guys can shortcut um, some of the uh, work that we did and make use of some of our resources. In terms of expectation setting, this has been one of our big outcomes from our work. Uh, whenever we are creating a learning environment, we have to think about the kind of learning environment we want to create. I really would encourage you to be talking and asking questions in the chat. Um, I will try to respond as we go, and uh, we'll also have some time at the end. But I will also try to address a balance of questions. One of the things about online webinars is that if you are a very fast typer, you can usually get in much more questions than other people. So if I don't respond to you, it's not necessarily because I don't think it's a very good question or anything like that. It's probably because I'm just trying to make sure that there's a good range of people uh, who are getting feedback. I often end my presentation with a slide like this, but I thought I would uh, turn this a little bit on its head today. This is my big research finding from the work that we've been doing. And it's this idea that when we record something, we transform it. So my poor partner, I really enjoy photography, and my poor partner has to follow me around uh, while I get into very weird positions trying to take a photo of something. And uh, there is what my partner sees on the left, and then there is the thing that I'm creating by making a recording of, um, of the space that we are in. And this probably seems very conceptual and a little bit weird, but I think this is a really good metaphor for what we're actually doing when we are recording a space. We're changing it. We're creating a fixed instance of that space. And that instance of that space is not necessarily uh, is not necessarily one which will um, reflect what everybody sees in that space, but it will be one that reflects something of what I see in that space or what something of what the class sees in that space. And it is a partial capture of the learning that happens in that room. And it can be really useful if you weren't there, if you didn't get the same thing that I got from going to this particular space. By seeing my recording of it, you do get something if not the, ex the full experience itself. So I find this a really useful metaphor for thinking about lecture recordings. We've published a paper on this in Computers and Education this year, and this is um, our broad set of themes which came out of our evaluation project. Basically, when we're talking about lecture recording, we have what we call ultimate concerns and proximate concerns. Ultimate concerns are these far off distant concerns, thinking about what education is, thinking about what is happening. And then proximate concerns are what's happening in that specific room and learning space. What we found really fascinating in our evaluation and what we then went on to develop a little bit more in our follow-up work 
was that there was a big split between how the students and the staff viewed the ultimate and proximate concerns in each lecture space. So for staff in the room, they're talking about lectures um, as a bit of a stage show. They're seeing it as um, a performance that they're giving. And that doesn't necessarily mean that staff are viewing uh, lectures as edutainment, but it means that they are kind of using a metaphor of a live gig very often, whereas they can say that the interaction between them and the students in that room makes it that unique learning space. They never give the same lecture twice. It's always going to be a little bit different. However, for students in the room, that lecture is just a tool. And I use the words just there, perhaps a little bit unfairly. But that lecture is going to facilitate their learning. It's a one-time opportunity to get that learning. And they want it to be as predictable in the sense of they want to know what's going to happen in that lecture. They want to kind of have an idea of what the room's going to be like. They want to be assured that they're going to be able to hear the lecturer, for example, if the lecturer is using a microphone. For example, we're having some audio problems for some people in the chat right now. And that kind of thing is frustrating, especially if there's only a one-off opportunity for uh, you to review the materials. And then ultimately, staff are interested in whether or not recording the lectures means that there's something changing in the learning. We had this concept of the canonicity of lectures. Once you've made a recording of something, there is um, a record of that, and that might be the one thing you go to reference. For example, at the start of this chat, when we were expectation setting, we told you that all of the recordings, including the chat, would be hosted online later. And that definitely might change the way you think about asking a question or typing something down, because there will be a record of it in future. Whereas for students, they're more thinking about lecture recording as a safety net, something which is going to be there to protect them when life gets in the way, um, as it very often does. So this was our big finding from our initial evaluation. But I want to talk about the operational aspects of this. And when I'm saying the operational aspects, we as academics, myself as an academic, we can spend a lot of time thinking about beautiful, airy concepts like what a recording does and the transformation of a, of a beautiful cathedral ceiling when you take a photo of it. And these are all lovely things to think about. But when we are actually thinking about how do we go about the business of teaching students, how do we support students in the best possible way with the best possible resources, one of the things that I think can be really useful is thinking about process. So I'm going to spend the rest of this talk talking about what evidence is. And I'm not going to get into the sort of more conceptual ideas of learning spaces and things like that. I'm going to be a little bit more practical. So when we're thinking about evidence, when we were thinking about evidence when we started evaluating um, the lecture recording rollout at Edinburgh, my big point that I make about any kind of analysis is that it's condensing information. We have this beautiful, diverse cohort of people uh, within the university, with staff, with students, and it's absolutely impossible for somebody who's going to be making a decision about policy, for example, to know every single person individually. So what I was tasked with doing was trying to summarize the people in our university, their concerns, and trying to make sure that we were representing that as concisely and accurately as possible. And we have lots of ways of doing that through the scientific method. There's a huge amount of resources on uh, how we can make the best use of evidence and make sure that evidence is uh, both robust and repeatable. And I'm going to talk about quantitative evidence and qualitative evidence because we used both in our evaluations. With quantitative evidence, there is um, a lot of work. If you're in any of the STEM fields, you're probably uh, hearing lots about open science, using shareable data, um, so making data sets available, using shareable workflows. So if you have an analysis process, you share that process so that somebody else could replicate what you do exactly. 
There's also, if data and workflows can't necessarily be shared, there's a lot of really good work looking at benchmarking and how we can really think about differences in quantitative results. I love what Alex Buckley does, um, and he's also done a webinar quite recently with the enhancement themes, um, and he talks about how we can use statistical significance to interpret the national student survey results. I think that's the excellent example of how we can use evidence appropriately and with a critical eye as well just because we found a number if I was to say to you 80% of students love lecture recording that number in itself might not necessarily be good evidence if I'm not telling you what does that mean how many students did I sample in the first place what's the variation in there is that representing all of the diverse groups of students equally. But one of the things that we really spent quite a lot of time on in our evaluation project was qualitative evidence. Now this is because we, in lecture recording, there is very often data in the sense that you know how many students have asked for lecture recording because that's usually in your course evaluation questionnaires, things like that. It's probably coming out in some of your national student survey data, in your learning resources. But we sometimes don't really understand how students are using something or why there is a motivation to do something. And qualitative evidence can also be used in a robust and shareable um, method or never in a robust and shareable uh, way. So we were really keen on this idea of triangulation. So this twining paper is an absolutely fabulous um, guidebook for how to do qualitative research in a robust method. Um, but we were checking all of our themes that came out of our data that we went and explored. We were checking it in terms of taking those results back to participants and saying, does this make sense to you? We used some theoretical triangulation to uh, look at different theories, such as constructivist uh, learning, and then seeing do the different theories give us some new way of looking at that data? We also had a lot of investigator triangulation because we had lots of different people exploring similar data um, through the use of our principal's teaching award scheme projects. And there are also ways that you can think of sharing qualitative data. So this is a paper that I've just had published in the Journal of Perspectives and Applied Academic Practice. Um, suggesting a way of using uh, qualitative data and sharing how we process that data, even if we can't necessarily share the data itself. But the thing that really came out of the second secondment was we were able to bring the staff and the student perspectives a little bit closer together. And as you can see from that first slide where we had the staff and student perspectives being quite far apart, that was actually a really important second stage of this secondment. And now we're in the stage where we're writing up guidance. As you can see, that is uh, greatly leaked into late 2019 as well, because uh, all academic projects that I lead seem to go on a little bit too long. In our evaluation, we had a student survey, we had some unstructured staff interviews, and we had a student focus group. And we used a range of, uh, of methods of triangulation in order to ensure that that evaluation could be compared with other evaluations in the future. Basically, it's not just me coming in saying this is what I think. We used lots of different data sources. So while the results that we publish for ethical reasons, they tend to come from our survey interviews and focus group, we also used our, um, our course evaluation surveys. We used feedback from our student unions. We used uh, feedback from the service provision, so the kind of um, IS help calls that people were raising to feed into the kind of information that we were collecting. We used surveys and interviews and focus groups to try and um, explore different methods. And there are things that you get out of an interview that you're not going to get out of a survey. 
there are great things about having focus groups, for example, where we were able to ask questions that we'd kind of come up with. Um, for example, we asked the students, how did they feel about this idea that staff might be made fun of? And it was really interesting to be able to pose that question to students and then get their feedback from that. Um, we used a little bit of theoretical triangulation, but not a huge amount. And we used investigator triangulation by having lots of additional projects going along at the same time. But one of the really great things, I think, about having this internal secondment of myself was that I had a pretty good understanding of the culture of the University of Edinburgh, because I'd already worked there, I already knew lots of people within this institution. And while sometimes there is this idea that objectivity is very important, Universities and higher education institutions, they are big things, they are oil tankers, it takes a long time to turn them and to instigate a big change like lecture recording where you're fundamentally changing the lecture space and the teaching space um, really quite transformatively. Having some internal knowledge, I would actually say, was incredibly helpful in the way that we ran our evaluation. And the reason why I'm telling you this, it might seem like a little bit of my opinion, and it is, but it's really important that you that we as a sector um, highlight our institutional memory. We highlight the things that kind of work, this knowledge that isn't necessarily published, but it's really useful and important to know. For example, people within Edinburgh are able to remember when PowerPoints came in, and they were able to say, well, I, you know, I remember what happened when we all had to start using PowerPoints, and I remember that there was this huge kerfuffle then, and there were concerns about how students were learning then. And being able to access that institutional memory by having internal members of staff looking at themselves is really, really important. So I'm going to move on now to the resources that I want to share with, um, with yourselves. So one of our massive results that we had at Edinburgh was this idea that students view the lectures as a tool, but staff are concerned about how they might be using the recordings. And that then came up with this really interesting question that we posed ourselves, how are we supporting students to use this tool? And this is the, um, the work that we've spent a lot of time doing now, trying to figure out how we as an institution support our students to use lecture recording. So we, like I know many people, um, are using Nordman, Nordman et al's guidance from Glasgow. Um, we actually embed her beautiful um, resources into our virtual learning environment. So this here is a screenshot of my Blackboard uh, virtual learning environment. You can see all my courses on the left. And then it says using lecture recordings. And, it's, and these um, little images change every time you log on, just to give you reminders of how to use the recordings. It's a way of using the learning environments that students have to uh, reinforce the messages that we want the students to be taking. We also have posters with those guidance up in certain lecture theatres. We've also generated some new Creative Commons licensed guidance, which um, I'm going to share with you guys as well. But I'm also going to share to you um, how we came up with that guidance if you wanted to create your own. So, my very first resource that I'm going to share with you is just this idea of using an internal researcher secondment to do these kind of evaluations. Um, it was incredibly useful for us. Uh, it was great for me personally because I was able to have a secondment within uh, the university. I was able to see how another department worked, um, and that is just in terms of personal development, that's a really wonderful thing. What I would say is when you're doing something internally, it can be a little bit tempting to dismiss your own work because you're, you, don't, you feel like, well, I just kind of came in and told you a little bit of what you already know. We could have gone further with our evaluation, I think, um, particularly with how we generated our guidance. And that's what I'm sort of trying to push now. I would also say that you have to recognize the limitations of internal secondments. One of the craziest things about the whole lecture recording project has been how often we've been affected by industrial action. Um, and it also, that 
the higher education sector at the moment is being affected by those things. And having that cultural knowledge is really important and helps you interpret the work that you've got. And I think it's really, really important to disseminate uh, your resources as well. And so with that in mind, the very first resource that I've shared as part of um, this is an outline of our evaluation at the University of Edinburgh. So this probably seems really silly, but this is basically how much time did we spend doing it? How did we cost for that? And, uh, and how did we space that out? over uh, about 18 months. Um, so if you yourself are thinking about how you would like to evaluate lecture recording or how you would like to explore the deployment of lecture recording, I have a resource here which shows you how we did it. I am more than happy for you to contact myself. Um, I'm sure the people in information services would also be really happy to talk to you about that. Uh, and you can see this is what we got out of it and whether or not that would be something that would be useful for yourselves. My second top tip is about starting conversations. And that's kind of coming back to this cultural guidance idea. So we, um, we have our guidance. We've created a workshop where we bring staff and students together to discuss some complex scenarios that don't necessarily have a right answer. From this, we've generated an Engage Ed Guide to Teaching with Lecture Recordings, which will be published in the new year. We've just confirmed the text. And my second resource for you is the outline to our workshop. Please take this workshop, use it, use the scenarios, add to it, adapt it however you wish. But it's a really good way of getting the conversations going. And it's something that I wish we'd started a lot earlier in a more structured manner when we were doing our evaluation. So I would really be very happy for you to use those resources and take them forward. And then my third big outcome from the evaluation was that we really identified a gap in our own practice as a university. And that makes it sound like none of us were doing it. There's some really good practice in the university. But in general, at an institutional oversight level, we had a bit of a gap because we weren't mainstreaming this idea of supporting students to use the lecture recording resource, even though we were providing a lot of resources, uh, even though we were providing the resource and we were promoting the fact that we had provided that resource. And we've kind of felt that we spent a lot of time telling students how not to use it, but we weren't supporting any of the strategies that we were seeing students um, organically developing. And so with that, we've produced a third resource called Revising with Recordings, which I had hoped we would have uh, beautified and presented, but I have just provided the text for you with resource three. Again, it's Creative Commons license, so you can adapt and use that however you wish. And if you keep an eye out, once I've finally got the prettified version, I will share a PDF of that as well. So it was a bit of a whistle-stop tour of quite a lot of work, and I hope that the idea of sharing the more implicit cultural knowledge aspects worked for you guys and made sense. We have a bunch of other resources. So there is the Edinburgh Story, which um, the Information Services team created, which is a great operational guide to how to roll out a massive lecture recording service. We have our full evaluations, which also includes the survey that we um, used. So you can take that survey and use it yourself if you want to compare and benchmark. And we also have the, uh, the middle point there is the, um, the other evaluations that we ran with our Principles Teaching Award Scheme, which if I had loads of time, I'd love to go into because I think it was a great example of how we were able to use evidence within our own institution and is something that I would 100% recommend if you were trying to uh, provide an evidence-based support for how you might use lecture recording in your own institution. But with that, that is uh, the end of me blabbering on. I'm very happy to take questions from yourself now. Um, just a reminder that this webinar has been part of a series. All of the videos, slides, and associated practical resources are available on the Enhancement Themes website. Grand. Thanks, Yassine. So, um, Liz, no, lecture recording is not compulsory at Edinburgh. We, um, we have what's called an opt-out policy. So our lectures are 
recorded. So anything that's classed as a lecture by our central timetabling is recorded by default, but you can opt out at several points. So you can opt out a whole course, uh, you can opt out a particular instance of a lecture, and you can also opt out in the room, which is one of the things that I um, that I really like, and I do that quite a lot, uh, even just to demonstrate to students that we don't necessarily have to record everything that we're discussing. I'll pause a recording during a discussion, which we can do in the room. So it's not compulsory, we, but it is an opt-out system. And we're not seeing a huge amount of opt-outs. Um, Ed's asking, how did industry industrial action, excuse me, impact on acceptance of the use of lecture recordings from staff. Um, purely in my opinion, I actually don't think it impacted a huge amount on um, people's acceptance because those who were already um, uncomfortable were uncomfortable before the industrial action happened and those who were comfortable, I didn't see a lot of people who were made more uncomfortable by the industrial action. What I would say is that the industrial action has made a lot of people think about how they want their work-life balance to be and how, do, how they feel monitored. And the lecture recording feeds into that. But I then we then have a sort of returning question about, no, that recording is there to supplement the learning. What do you want your teaching space to look like? Now, that has been very much our institutional response to lecture recording has been this idea that we are now using this as an opportunity to talk about what do we want lecture recording to look like. And that does not mean that lecture recording itself is not political. And Melissa Hyten has some really fabulous talks on the Association of Learning Technologists YouTube channel about how she used, um, how she and the unions talked together about implementing the lecture recording program. And I think this is the kind of thing where, again, it's important to have the cultural aspect when you're doing any evaluation like this. It's important to look at how you're responding. Um, Helen's making a good point about recorded lectures. Um, we have a tendency to talk about lecture capture, that the whole experience is captured, whereas recording is more appropriate for what's actually going on. I think that's a huge, I think that's a great point, Helen. Um, and I also, yeah, we kind of, we were debating this. We also have an um, enhancement themes collaborative cluster on widening participation. Um, if anyone's on Twitter, if you follow lecture CPTR, um, I'll share the link in the chat. Uh, and if you follow the Enhancement Themes website, you'll, you'll find it. Um, but we've been talking about that as well. Is it, if we're talking about teaching being captured, is that maybe setting up a different example for students or a different expectation for students? And particularly for students who maybe don't have a lot of experience of what university is like as well. So I think words matter and how we talk about, you know, these things do matter. And we need to set those expectations for students um, and, you know, for anybody in that room about how we're going to use those resources and how we're going to use that data and how they should use that data as well.